Pittsburgh Steeler fans, we are in the early stages of fantasy football season and fantasy experts across America are solidifying their rankings and analysis on this year's fantasy outlook. So what better time to have two of the best in the business join us here on the Steelers Fix. In case you missed last week's show, Jeremy and I were talking about some of our favorite fantasy experts that we listen to. And we said, you know, there's these guys on YouTube that are really, really good. They're called the fantasy headliners. They continue to grow. They do a great job. Wouldn't it be great if we were able to get them on the show? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to be joined today by Kyle Richardson and Jake Hubman of the fantasy headliners. They have a fantastic draft guide that they do every year. Make sure you go and check that out. Every review I've seen of it is phenomenal. So be sure to go and check that out. Guys, thank you so much for coming on. How is it going tonight? Absolutely. We are uh, glad to have you. Uh, glad to be here. Glad to join you guys. Talk a little bit of Steelers football here for a little bit. Yeah. I feel like yeah. we have a lot to live up to with that intro. I we know. have that it was just shy of Bruce right Buffer now. right there. You know what <laughs> I mean? I feel like I'm getting ready to go into a UFC octagon. You guys have done a ton for my fantasy team. So I am extremely grateful and make sure you go and check them out. They have a ton of content every day on YouTube. Uh, just totally free content that you can go and check out. Very insightful. Jeremy, I know that you've started uh, listening to them as well, and you've been pretty impressed too. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm enjoying, I enjoy guys who keep it real on the podcast. You know, it's not a bunch of rhetoric. You're, you're having fun and, and doing what you love, right? That's, that's what this is all about. So yeah, we kind of, really we kind of look at it like this. We want to have a, a, an outlet for people to sit, sit down. Like like they're talking with their boys sitting down and have a nice cold drink somewhere, just talking football. Like that's the kind of atmosphere we like to have. Yeah. Yeah. It comes across and we're excited to have you guys join us here. Andrew, I know we've got a lot of Steelers questions for, for these guys, but uh, did you want to preface before we get into questions with anything else? Not immediately, but I, one thing that Jeremy and I have discussed a lot is the different styles of fantasy football just the, whether it comes from format to whether do you prefer dynasty ppr non-ppr um whether you prefer super flex you know there's so many there's endless choices when it comes to fantasy football and how you like it what are your guys's preference what's your favorite type of fantasy league whether from be scoring setting whether it be just roster settings what do you guys prefer if you have your choice i'm always talking kyle you can go first <laughs> Well, recently in the last couple of years, I've actually really started toning down the leagues that I play because I was playing in like 15 to 20 leagues at one point in time, but we do so much content, so much work now it's gotten to the point where I'd rather help other people win than worry about winning myself. So I, you know, I try to do a couple of redraft leagues a year now, maybe make one of them super flex or something. But for me, I really don't have like a preferred type of fantasy football league that I play in. For me, it's just about having fun. I don't play in any like high stakes leagues anymore or anything like that. So just, you know, toning it down to a couple, keeping it, you know, kind of on the lower end of what we're doing, just have fun with it. That's kind of what I'm into at this point. Yeah. I mean, I think once we realized that, the audience was growing and people were listening to what we have to say. It makes it a bajillion times harder for us to go out there and find any success and actually playing the game because everybody is using our own strategies against us. So it makes it a lot of fun still. uh, But I'm kind of like Kyle. I used to probably be in 10 plus leagues a year. Now it's down to about three or so. We're all kind of have a good mix of a super flex league, a regular redraft, a dynasty league, something like that to where I have a little bit of everything, but not too much because it was getting to the point there where I would forget to set my own lineup because I was too busy recording videos for everybody to set theirs. Or I'd be live on Sunday morning doing a live show and it's like, Oh, so-and-so's out. Well, I can't really change my lineup right now. So I take a zero. Right. Oh man. Yeah. I've been there. I've, I think I'm in 12 leagues this year. So I'm, I'm feeling that, that pressure last year I was in eight and it was like, it was all right, but you know, I just hate saying no to friends. Yeah, I hate saying no to friends that ask me to join their leagues because they know I that I enjoy it. I talk about it, so they they want me to be a part of it, and I'm sure. like, sure, sign me up. So I think I'm gonna do some best ball leagues this year where I don't have to worry about it during the season. You know, just kind of enjoy the draft and yep. and get get into it that way. So and I was in the headliners' best ball contest they did last year. Are you guys doing another one this year? It's not going to be best ball this year. It's going to be an actual redraft tournament. We're going to have probably over a thousand teams in one tournament. We actually just dropped the link to it this morning. So uh, actually dropped the link and 
almost crashed the fan track site. Uh, <laughs> so about broke we, yeah, we about broke it. So we kind of had to do a little bit of a regroup there. We dropped the link yeah. again this afternoon. People are already filing in there. So it's going to be about a thousand plus teams uh, broken down into 12 team formats. They'll have a regular season. And by the time we get to the postseason, it's going to start being competing off of total points uh, from the leaders of each division and walking away with some pretty sweet prizes. Man, that's, an, that's awesome. Uh, Steeler fans listening to this, go check that out. Sign up and get involved. Let's jump into some Steelers topics here. This is BehindTheSteelCurtain.com, where we are the one-stop shop for all things Pittsburgh Steelers. So we're going to talk a little bit about some Steelers fantasy football players. We were talking, Andrew and I, last week about uh, some floors and ceilings for the Steelers' uh, fantasy uh, assets, if you will. Um, We were talking Najee Harris, and I think, uh, like, I made the point – could you see him being the top overall score in fantasy football this year? I think you could, but I wanted to see where you guys come down on Najee Harris. Is there, is there a too high of a draft point to, to reach for Najee Harris? So I do have to say here real quick, when Jake messaged me last week, he was like, Hey, these guys reached out to me. You want to hop on with them this coming week? I was like, yeah, absolutely. But quick question, is this a setup? And he goes, well, what do you mean? Well, I've been pretty high on the, Joe Mixon is higher than Najee Harris train for me this year. Now, Mixon is behind me, too. So you have to anybody listening has to kind of take what I have to say with a grain of salt right now. I'm a big Joe Mixon fan. I'm not a Cincinnati fan. I like him. Whatever. I'm just a Joe Mixon fan. I have been since he was drafted. But I like this offseason. I've kind of had like these battles with several people where it's like they're completely downplaying Joe Mixon. They're like, oh, I would take Najee Harris over him. And I've done some content where I've said, you know, What's your problem with Mixon? Oh, efficiency? Well, Najee Harris wasn't super efficient last year. Oh, what's your problem with Mixon? You didn't like his offensive line this year? Yes, Pittsburgh's done some work, but is it really going to be, you know, that good this year? So I don't have anything against Najee Harris. Super talented, still a top 10 running back for me. I was just a little bit worried I was going to get set up and you guys were going to be like, hey, we've heard what you've been saying about our boy. We needed to bring you on here to shut you up. (laughs) <laughs> and, yeah. and I'm I'm of the similar mindset. Could he be the number one score? Hundred percent. I think at this yeah. point in the offseason, anybody could be the number one. But I really feel that we have to be somewhat careful with Najee because Najee last year had 381 total touches as a rookie. That number can't stay the same for multiple years if we want Najee to be a thing for the long haul because we don't right. want to get him overworked. What's going to happen at the quarterback position, I think, is the biggest question mark. I mean, we call him Mitchie Biscuits, Mitch Trubisky. I kind of expect him to kind of be the guy there week one, and then at some point they're going to transition to Kenny Pickett. Too much draft capital not to, unless they're going out there and they're undefeated with Mitchell Trubisky. Uh, Won't happen, but. They probably won't. (laughs) We'll see about that, yeah. Uh, But I I think that it's two different, you know, mindsets when it comes to how do we handle Najee Harris with the two different quarterbacks. I think once Kenny Pickett gets in the game, you're going to see a little bit more of a vertical offense. I love Chase Claypool once Kenny Pickett's under center. I think he really fits that style of play Mm -hmm. a lot better. We haven't seen Chase Claypool really be able to do anything the last couple years because Ben wasn't mobile enough and couldn't throw the ball deep down the field. So he was basically a decoy for some time. So, you know, it it all depends, but Najee is definitely going to be somebody who flirts with right around 275 total touches He's going to be involved in the passing game, but unlike last year, there's a lot more options. I feel like this year, uh, I like George Pickens. I like Chase Claypool, Deontay Johnson in a contract season. I love Pat Fryermuth. You know I mean? There's just other guys there where I can't say that Najee is going to go out there and get a hundred targets a year to really catapult him against some of these other guys. Just one of those things where when you take a look at it and you say, Hey, like, the efficiency from last year wasn't great, but he made right. up for it with the volume. The volume was fantastic. But if we see that volume come back at all, does that efficiency start to come up? And that's where you really start to get guys where you can trust on a yearly basis, weekly basis. Cause I did like a thing with riskiest running backs a couple of weeks ago. And I was kind of, I had like this spreadsheet where I broke guys down by finishes as an RB one, RB two, RB three. And based on that risk score, like Najee and Joe Mixon ended up being like right next to each other, same exact mm. score. The one problem was, is that Najee Harris finished, finished higher a lot more often, but he also finished outside the top 24 more often as well. So that's one of those things where we got to squeeze that together and we got to find that middle ground and has Pittsburgh done enough on the offensive line that if they do decrease that mm. volume, that we can get that efficiency where it needs to be for top tier running backs. Sure. 
See, I think it's interesting that you mentioned Joe Mixon because for years I was a huge fan of Mixon because I, I play non-PPR. I, I'm still the old school. I like that. You know, I go for the guys that I think are going to have a lot of volume, uh, whether the, regardless of how good they are in the passing game. And of course, Mixon, he can catch passes, but um, I was really relying on the volume considering they didn't have a whole lot of depth in Cincinnati behind him. So I drafted him, I think, three years in a row, second, third round, drafted a, put a lot of draft capital into it. And last year was the first year I'm like, okay, I'm not going to get bit by the Joe Mixon train again. <laughs> and sure enough, that's the year he finally breaks yeah. out. So I have a question, a personal fantasy question. Every year in my fantasy, my main fantasy league, we do a draft drawing about a month before our draft. This year we have to do it early because of different reasons. So our draft's July 23rd. Okay, we've cool. already drawn for the draft order. I'm picking ninth. On NFL.com's rankings, because we do it on NFL.com, their rankings, they generally change them around mid-July because right now they're a bit off, let's just say. Right now, I believe the eighth player is, okay, it's starting at seven, you have Najee Harris. I think he's going to be off the board. I know somebody else in the league that's really high on him. Then you have Nick Chubb, Christian McCaffrey, and then you have a bunch of receivers, Jamar Chase, Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill. You have some other guys there. Who should I be targeting with that ninth pick? Maybe there's other Steelers fans listening that are in similar situations. If Christian McCaffrey's sitting there or if one of the top receivers are sitting there, who are some guys I should be targeting at the back end of round one? And you said this is a standard draft, right? So no, no point, yep. pe- uh, point per reception? Correct. I mean, I'm going to have a hard time not having some personal bias into this one because I think <laughs> it, it fits perfectly for Nick Chubb. And Nick yeah. Chubb gets a ton of hate. And most of it can be dispelled within about three to five minutes of talking because a lot of people look at Nick Chubb and uh, Kareem Hunt is there. Well, Kareem Hunt's been there for a few years and he continues right. to finish inside the top 12. So who cares? Oh, uh, well, every time they get in the red zone, uh, they, they pull out Nick Chubb and they put in Kareem Hunt. Well, that's because Nick Chubb just had a 60 yard run to get him inside the red zone and dude just happened to get a breather. So when you look at a guy, especially in the first round, I am not huge on risk early because the bigger the risk you take early on, the more you set yourself up for potential Mm -hmm. failure later. So in my opinion, I don't know if it gets much safer than Nick Chubb in the, in the back half of the first round. After that, you can kind of reevaluate. Now, honestly, if you're sitting there and your boy Najee is on the board, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that either. But uh, if he's not and all the other top tier uh, standard type, uh, running backs are off the board. The Jonathan Taylors are gone. The Derrick Henrys are gone. Dalvin Cook will probably be gone. I, in a standard league, I'm going to go with Nick Chubb over over Christian McCaffrey at that point. Yeah, and the back end of the first round is is really kind of a let's flow with what's going on for me mm-hmm. this year. And in, in years past, it's been like, well, you know, so and so guy could end up falling here, and you could really hammer home like an RB RB start or like a RB wide receiver start. Really, for me this year, it kind of depends on how much of a fan people are of those wide receivers, because we're seeing kind of a transition this year in fantasy football where people are like, no, I'm staying away from the running backs because I'm tired of losing my first round running back to injury. So I'm going to go with a wide receiver instead, which I mean, Jake did a video on this a couple of weeks back that completely dispelled any argument for that because running backs have actually been safer over the past few years in the the first round than what wide receivers have been. Hmm. But when you get to that back half, you know, how early did Jamar Chase go? How early did Justin Jefferson go? How early did Cooper? Those three guys are really determining how the back half is laying out right now, because if guys are jumping early to draft them, you're getting great value at the end of the first round with Mixon, Chubb, Najee, any of those guys that are kind of falling down that way, you can grab them at the end. If it's, if it's a heavy league where like in yours where it's standard and there's going to be a lot of running backs and you can expect those wide receivers to probably fall. Then at that point, if you're staring at them and like Chubb is already off the board and now you're kind of like, you know, there isn't like a running back. I love here, like in a standard for me, I'm grabbing Jamar chase. I'm going to take him there just because of the big playability mm. and the t- big play touchdowns. I'll take him in a standard league um, over Cooper cup, just because Cooper cup is going to be a, you know, a whole lot of volume with maybe some of those bigger plays going to Allen Robinson this year. And of course, Van Jefferson being the guy that kind of takes the top off. So for me, it's like, where do those three wide receivers go? If they go early, you're set up great. If guys skip on them and they fall to you, that's where you kind of at that point got to try and balance yourself a little bit. Before I pass it over to Jeremy, a follow-up question on that. On the snake back in the second round, 
is that too high for a guy like CD Lamb? If the if Christian McCaffrey, I'd, in the event that he happened to fall that far on the fallback, would he be a guy to consider? I kind of doubt Jamar Chase is still going to be there. You know, what receivers do you think would be? Is that too high for CD Lamb? Is there another guy in that range that you are comfortable with, or would you say pound the running back again at the start of the second? Yeah. It's really going to depend, I think, yeah. who's yeah. sitting there when you do that. Uh, I don't have anything <laughs> against CD Lamb, but personally, there's other guys. Justin Jefferson is somebody who I'll have ahead of CD Lamb. Mm-hmm. Um, Stephon Diggs is another guy I'll probably have in front of CD Lamb. I, I, you know, it's not that I dislike CD Lamb, but we've always kind of had Amari Cooper there, and CD Lamb was able to take the second best def- defender on the on the opposing team's defense and, and really you know, exploit that. What's going to happen now with Noah Mari Cooper, Michael Gallup coming back from a torn ACL, Cedric Wilson's now in Miami. Mm -hmm. Zeke is quote unquote lost a step a little bit. So there's going to be so many other question marks there where CD Lamb's going to have to go out there and get the opposing team's number one every week. Can he perform with that? We don't know. He's really excelled in the slot in the past. So if we don't, I know guys like Justin Jefferson are going to excel. I know guys like Stephon Diggs are going to excel. So I would personally rather have one of those guys over a CD lamb that early in the second. And for me too, kind of when we get back there, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be scared to move early on a running back in a standard mm-hmm. league anyway, because drafting that far back, you're picking 10 of 12. You said, right. Um, ninth and 11th. Yeah. Ninth. Okay. Yep. So if you're picking there, you know, knowing that it's, you're gonna have to wait for it to wrap all the way back around you and being a standard league, you're probably going to see those running backs. I mean, if you go early and I, Leonard Fournette, you know, that might be a little bit early at the beginning of the second, but he's not going to be there for you in the third. So if you hammer like a Nick Chubb in the first, Mm -hmm. a Leonard Fournette in the second, now you're really, really good with your running backs. And then we can take a look at those wide receivers kind of wrapping back to the third and the fourth when maybe like a guy like Mike Evans may be there where he isn't going to be as volume dependent, big play touchdowns, great for a standard league. Um, another guy, T Higgins, we know that T Higgins is going to be a guy that's going to be up and down with chase being the wide receiver one, but he's just as prone as to those big plays. And last year, if he hadn't missed those four games, there's a really good chance he finishes with just as many targets and receptions, if not more than what Jamar chase had as well. So he's going to be good in that area too. And that's going to kind of help then give you a really balanced start, but now you're feeling really good with those running backs. So as you kind of get a little bit into it, you're not trying to draft those guys a lot further, like in advance than you would want to. And now you're missing out a good value on those spots. Yeah. I feel like running back is, is something that you can, you can take early and wait on wide receivers in most leagues, especially PPR. I mean, you can wait on wide receiver. I did a, um, a mock draft the other day and I took four running backs to start my draft. And I still ended up with uh, Deontay Johnson and Chris Godwin and, um, let's see, Gabe Davis on my roster, you know, and I felt really good about that as a mock. So I think you can do that. I wanted to kind of bring up a thought here. Uh, We talked a little bit about Nick Chubb there. Uh, How insane would Nick Chubb's efficiency with Najee Harris's tut workload be for fantasy? I mean, if we got a player like that, RB1. RB1. Number one overall. (laughs) It wouldn't even uh, be close. No, no, that'd be some kind of record setting performance for sure. And here's the thing, too. We are like a Kareem Hunt trade or injury away from seeing that. I mean, that's just how good Nick Chubb is. I mean, if if they ever just said, all right, we're going to lean on Chubb and give him the volume. If, you know, if if they do get move, move on from Kareem Hunt at any point in time. You know, he could be, especially this year, you know, uh, depending on what happens with Deshaun Watson at this point, which we're Mm -hmm. still kind of waiting to hear if Jacoby Brissett is that guy to get things started, expect, you know, a heavy, heavy run game to get things going. But Nick Chubb is so good and so efficient that Jacoby Brissett will be just good enough to keep defenses a little bit balanced. So they're not Mm -hmm. packing eight, nine in the box every single snap. And Chubb's just going to run all over the place. So, I mean, we're really close to seeing that type of a guy anyway. It, it just hasn't quite happened yet. Sure. Will it? I don't know at this point. Cleveland probably doesn't want to destroy him like that. But, you know, it, it if there was no Kareem Hunt, it'd be interesting to see where people would rank Nick Chubb going into a season. And you know, I thought we, we saw that a little bit last year. Uh, and Dearness Johnson kind of stepped right into that Kareem Hunt role and had had a little bit of success there. I, I not or uh, sorry. I'm Steelers focused here. Uh, Mm -hmm. Nick Chubb did have um, better performances. I think if you, I don't 
recall the exact numbers, but I did notice that he did get a little more touches, but the efficiency remained there. And man, five yards of carry plus over the course of his career, that's that's insane. I did want to focus in on the wide receivers here in Pittsburgh because we, uh, Jake, you talked about a little bit already. Chase Claypool, the upside for him, probably tr- pretty tremendous this year. I think he probably owns the highest upside of any of these wide receivers, really. But I wanted to get y'all's thoughts on that as well. Uh, where do you come down on the the three top wide receivers here? I think not uh, Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool and George Pickens, I think, sneaks in there, too, as a guy to keep an eye on. Um, how do you see that shaking out for the wide receivers this year for the Steelers? I think the biggest thing with Deontay is a lot of people look at the past couple years and they assume the same this year. Right. But you can't because that's with Big Ben. And Big Ben would lock on to Deontay Johnson and just feed him the football. Yeah. Are they going to do that with Mitch Trubisky? Are they going to do that with Kenny Pickett? It's possible. Like He still could be the guy going out there and getting 10 targets a game, but it's more of an assumption at this point instead of just like, you know, uh, we can kind of bank on it. Uh, I like George Pickens a lot. I don't know if George Pickens is going to be much of a volume type guy. I think he's going to be a little bit more of a a big play, a 50-50 type ball guy, uh, somebody who's going to get chunk yardage at times. I I think the big plays go the way of Chase Claypool. I still think Deontay Johnson probably leads the team in receptions and is probably still their number one option. But I think a lot of those touchdowns start, start migrating other places, and it's going to be Claypool, and it's going to be to Pat Fryermuth, in my opinion, especially once they get inside the red zone. Right. Yeah, and it's the big thing, and again, like we've already discussed, is is the quarterbacks. Like, if you could tell me right now, hey, we're going to get Mitchell Trubisky for four weeks and then Kenny Pickett the rest of the way, I'd be more inclined to invest in some of these guys. Now, I'm not a Mitchell Trubisky fan either, but, you know, I'd be more inclined to invest in some of these guys in my sure. draft. But if Mitchell Trubisky comes out and he's the starter and he goes – you know, he plays well enough that Pittsburgh's winning, which I could see happening, you know, at that point, it's like, okay, when do they actually turn it over to Kenny Pickett? Now, the one thing I think Pickett's got going for him is first round draft capital, hometown guy, people are excited for him, kind of the next chapter in Pittsburgh now that Roethlisberger's gone. So I think it's a better chance, but we're not going to know that for a while. So that's why it's been kind of hard for me to invest in some of these guys, just because I don't know, are we going to get Trubisky for four games? Are we going to get him for six? Are we going to get him for a full season? Are we going to get him for zero games? And if it's Trubisky, I just, I don't rely on the guy. I just, I know a lot of people are like, Oh, he was in Buffalo and he got a chance to learn and, you know, saw how Josh Allen played and was with a great, great coaching staff. I get that, but I wasn't a fan with him coming out either. Cause he had some tools, but really he was based on some really good college stats and the bears made an absolute awful decision taking him where they did. And unfortunately that's just kind of hindered his development. So uh, for me, it's, I mean, I, the, the upsides there, I like the upside of some of these guys. I like the volume upside of Deontay Johnson. I like the big play upside of chase Claypool It's just, who are we going to get? Who are we going to get? You mentioned one of you guys mentioned Pat Fryermuth a minute ago, and we know the tight end position in fantasy football. It's difficult to predict because there's not a whole lot of depth. And there's some guys that bring upside. I mean, I think of Cole Komet, um, a guy with the Bears who could have some decent volume. Um, I mean, even in some websites, if Taysom Hill's list as a tight end, maybe you take a chance on him in the later rounds, considering that maybe he could play quarterback. Um, but how much volume does Pat Fryermuth need to get in the Steelers' offense to be a consistent? option and a consistent starting option in fantasy it doesn't take much it doesn't take much ends. it doesn't take much <laughs> that's exactly we enough. we say the same thing on a weekly basis you could trip and fall into the end zone as a tight end and you're probably a tight end one for the week so it doesn't take a whole lot of volume volume's actually like the added point to it if a tight end's getting a decent amount of volume you absolutely have to roster him it's the guys that are like the touchdown potential in the end zone, which was kind of what Fryermuth was last year. He gave you some of that touchdown potential. Um, I, I love him. I love him in that offense. I think he's a super talented player. Mm-hmm. Um, if we get Pickett and they're able to be a little bit more vertical with the offense, it's really going to open up that entire middle of the field because you're going to have Pickens that can stretch. You have Clay, Chase Claypool that can stretch. You've got Deontay Johnson that can win basically any route in the route tree. You've got Najee Harris in the backfield that you're going to have to account for on those swing routes. It's going to that pocket in the middle of the field around that middle linebacker, you know, those outside linebackers, or if you're playing nickel or whatever you're doing and you're having to account for different positions on the field, it's going to leave that entire pocket of the middle of the field open 
Fryermuth really just has to go out and either sit in front of the middle linebacker or behind him because there's not a whole lot of guys that are going to be able to stay with him as a linebacker. And if they're doing some type of a zone coverage, he's going to have pockets to just go sit and be absolutely fine. in. so I think it's there. If they can get the vertical game going to open all that up in the middle of the field, dude's going to be a consistent contributor, I think. And last year he was, he was tight end 13 just Mm -hmm. last year. I mean, he just missed being a tight end one in his rookie year. And when you look at his stat line, 79 targets, 60 receptions for 497 and seven touchdowns. I don't know if I want to go too much higher on the seven touchdowns, but I could I could definitely see a few more receptions in there right around that 70 to 75 mm-hmm. mark, flirting with right around 600 yards or so. And that definitely puts him in the range of being a top 10 tight end. Well, and you got to think he also played behind Eric Ebron for like the first yep. four or five or six games of the season before he really made his mark. And like, if we're talking a breakout, fantasy player on the Steelers I think you've got to put Pat Fryermuth at the top of your list as far I would put as put him definitely higher than George Piggins right yeah absolutely yeah. I, I we've been talking about Fryermuth kind of running as the team's second or third receive receiving option on the team and I think you guys mentioned that in your most recent uh podcast too I got a chance to listen to uh, the one where you talked about Deontay Johnson and the Steelers probably not reaching that 20 million dollar Mm-hmm. threshold and, yeah. and whatnot so um given the fact that the Steelers probably will decline to pay Deontay do you think that that makes this year a big year for Chase Claypool to to make his mark as as a wide receiver one to do the Steelers have an issue if that does not happen and and then maybe there's more pressure to to sign Deontay Johnson maybe a little bit but I still like Calvin Austin a little bit and I sure. I kind of feel like if if Claypool fails, okay, that was it is what it is. We got where you are, but we'll just transition over here. And we got another guy that can kind of stretch the field. So hmm. it, it's all about, and you guys probably know this a lot better than than we do. Pittsburgh very rarely pays big dollars to free agents, whether they're on the team or they're not. Antonio Brown, I believe, was the last one, and it may be the reason it was the last one because they <laughs> they gave him almost what 18, 19 million dollars a year. So yeah. Especially you on know the that, offensive side of the ball. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. That's for sure. Uh, so I don't know if the Steelers are the type of team that really need to do that. Because over time, they've shown that, hey, you thought we were crazy for letting Antonio Brown go. And Deontay Johnson stepped up. You know, I mean, it just seems like every, you know, every so often that they just keep finding guys. Every sure. single year, every couple of drafts, a wide receiver pops up that ends up being great with them. Mm-hmm. What happens with Juju now that he's no longer there and he goes to Kansas City? Is he... What he was in Pittsburgh before the injury, maybe we don't even know. But it just seems that Pittsburgh has that knack for finding wide receivers that can outproduce where they were drafted at. George Pickens, Calvin Austin could be perfect examples and the reasons why they don't spend that extra money. Yeah, and I don't know if it's make or break on Claypool, really, just because I don't think his performance is basically going to dictate what the Steelers do with Deontay Johnson at this point. I think Deontay Johnson is pretty much done in Pittsburgh, regardless sure. of what Chase could, even if Chase Claypool had an awful year, I just, I don't feel like this is the team's path because that division is getting a lot, lot better and they need to get younger and they need to be in a position where they can set themselves up to be successful for the next X amount of years, just like they have been coming into this point. So, you know, paying a whole bunch of money to a wide receiver, isn't really going to help with that. So yeah, let, let fire Muth be that guy, you know, sure. you know, let him become that guy where, you know, you've had tight ends in the past in Pittsburgh that have been, you know, decent performers have done good things, you know, let, let him be a guy that maybe takes that to a little bit to the next level. And you still got Austin and you still got Claypool for next year. George Pickens is a guy that definitely can play on the outside and be just fine. If it hadn't been for the injury, he would probably be considered a lot higher in this year's oh, draft yeah. than what he was. So I think there's, I think they're set up well. I think paying Johnson would be a massive mistake, especially if you're going to have to pay Pickett. If he turns out to be as good as they hope he will be, you're going to have to pay him an extension in three to four years anyway. Definitely. One last question before we get on out of here. Jeremy and I are both baffled about the fact that Chris Boswell <laughs> is going undrafted in a lot of leagues. I mean, he, he finished, I believe, as a top five kicker last year in fantasy. He's rarely ranked inside the top eight to 10 in any fantasy rankings that you see. 
Never. And that was in last year, his top five performance was in offense that struggled to push the ball down the field. I don't think it's going to be any worse this year with the year that Mitch or the 2020, when Mitch Trubisky and Andy Dalton were kind of going back and forth at the quarterback position in Chicago. I believe it was Cairo Santos who finished as a top 10 kicker. I believe Chris Boswell is capable of being a better kicker than Cairo Santos overall. This may be an odd question before we let you go, but why is Chris Boswell not getting any love in kicker rankings? I, I can pretty much how I feel about kickers is like this, especially when it comes to fantasy football. I want a proven high powered offense that plays indoors because what happens outdoors is now all of a sudden you have to start contending with weather. Well, weather in Pittsburgh second half of the season can get a little ugly at times. A little dicey. Why would I, why, why would I want to risk it with the weather when I can take Matt Gay of the Rams and kick indoors? You know what I mean? It's just something like that. And I, th- I think that's really the only reason. Cause I think when it comes to actual kicking uh, Boswell is, is going to be among the league leaders. I don't think there's any issues with that. I think it's just more of a strategy in fantasy football that you really see a lot of these guys that kick indoors, get drafted higher, just so people don't have to, to take the weather into account every single week. Uh, they know that at least half their schedule, half their games, you can put them in there, not have to worry about it. And, you know, to be truthful about this too, maybe 1% of fantasy football players do any type of kicker research. (laughs) So more than likely too, they're just looking at the teams and they're saying, Oh, Hey, I know this team is probably going to score some points. They're looking at Pittsburgh and they're just saying, ah, tough, tough offense this year. Don't know who the quarterback's going to be. Don't know how they're going to move the ball that people just look at it and automatically say this. But like you said, they, he did just fine last year, but there probably aren't a whole lot of people that, have looked at that either so it, it, to, to me just when you're drafting kickers it comes down to the last couple of rounds people are just like oh high-powered offense boop 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 yeah. just just going with it like that checking those projections out and not necessarily thinking too deep about it yeah actually yeah. hold on i oh. think in my mock draft video from today i drafted him hold oh, on hey. a second i Uh-oh. want to look at this oh, not, real now you're quick. even gonna pull it up because hey, I, yeah. let's go I, <laughs> I just want to show people who might be upset with me about mixing over <laughs> that you took Boswell. <laughs> i want them to know it, that re yourself to steal their nation <laughs> i have got to go to the tape oh jake oh, okay i was confused here jake's already put his video in for today working ahead jake i love it hey yeah, no, but well, that, that's probably the whole thing with kickers, though. It's just yeah. people don't research them, and that's well, the whole thing. That's kind of like they just rely on us to tell them what to do when it comes to kickers. Well, Kai, are you a Michigan fan? No, no, God, I'm wrong. He, I took their defense. I didn't take their kicker. He oh, is a Michigan go. fan, but don't give him too much yes. credit okay, for yeah, it. Okay, let's not talk about you said that. about Joe Mixon or any other Steelers <laughs> rival. There we go. Let's go. Blue. Let's not talk about <laughs> Michigan. On here, All right. Please. Anything <laughs> that you guys would like to plug, go ahead and do it. Tell people where they can find you at. Yeah, no, absolutely. If they, if they are interested in fantasy football, just head over to YouTube, search for the fantasy headliners. Like you guys said earlier, we do a video every single day, uh, almost of the entire year. Once in season comes, we're doing 11 videos a week to make sure you have everything you possibly need to dominate in fantasy football. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at FNTSY headliners, and you can find Kyle at krich1532. Sorry for speaking for you, Kyle, but I was kind of on a roll. That's okay. I mean, if you follow me on Twitter, you're going to get sarcastic tweets the majority of the time. That's all I, I do. I just have fun yeah. on Twitter. I don't, I don't oh, man. have a whole lot of meaningful stuff. If you want real stuff, go to YouTube. Come to the channel and find yeah. it. Following right now on Twitter. Let's That's go. That's right. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, guys. We really appreciate you coming on and uh, talking some Steelers. Uh, Jake, you're a Bills fan, right? I am always born and raised in Arizona, so I'm a Cardinals fan. Oh, you're a Cardinals fan. Yes. Who am I thinking is a Bills fan? Chris Chouse on our team is a oh, diehard okay. Bills fan. That's who it is. Okay. He never shuts up about it. Yeah, yeah, I, I noticed that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sure, okay. Well, hey, uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Andrew, I'll let you close it out, man. All right, yeah, guys, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome back anytime you would like. Thank you once again. Yep, absolutely, have a good one. Yeah, thanks.